Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening for a conversation, a community conversation between um, Paul Manley, uh, Diane Dunsmore Farley, and um, <clears throat> Steve Earl. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Sinanamuk First Nations and that the uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith also includes the traditional territories or part of the traditional territories of the Stanawas, Suminas, and Laaxan First Nations. Um, there is a, a YouTube comment channel where uh, you can feel free to ask questions and um, we will bring them up for the um, participants to, to answer them. As well, please uh, make sure to remain friendly and cordial in the comment uh, section and uh, Lori will be moderating that, uh, that section. And now I'd like to pass it on to Paul Manley. Well, thank you very much, Alain, and uh, welcome back to our community conversation. Um, as you know, we're in the middle still of this uh, COVID pandemic, and the House of Commons is doing uh, summer sessions. We don't normally do that. Usually the uh, House of Commons adjourns for the summer in the third week of June and doesn't go back until the third week of September, but we have four uh, sessions this summer, and uh, I'm on house duty on August 26th, so, so I get to fly back to uh, Ottawa to be in the house, be one of the 50 members of parliament that are in the house. We actually have a hybrid parliament now, so uh, other parliamentarians, members of parliament can participate online um, and ask questions of the government, ask questions of uh, speakers, and um, take part that way. And uh, uh, the Committee on, on Procedural Affairs for the House of Commons has just done a report on how we can uh, implement virtual voting so that um, you know it's easy to count who, who votes in the House of Commons because we all stand uh, for a standing vote and the clerk calls our name. Uh, so there's nothing secret about how we, how we vote at all. And we're just working out the process to do that so that we can have a full virtual parliament in September. And that's because having um, uh, 338 members of parliament in the House of Commons in close quarters, and then traveling back and forth across the country to our ridings would be uh, not a good situation in, in terms of spreading COVID-19 if, if it starts to spread among MPs. And there are MPs who have compromised immune systems. We have members of parliament who have family members who have compromised immune systems. And then there's different jurisdictions we have to go into that people return to where there's quarantine rules. And of course, on uh, July 13th, we saw a plane uh, flying from uh, Toronto to Vancouver where somebody had COVID-19 on that plane and everybody had to go into isolation for 14 days afterwards. And then that, that passenger had carried on from Vancouver to Victoria and anybody who was on that flight had to go into isolation as well. So uh, we're participating and doing what we can in uh, online in a hybrid parliament. Of course, we all wanna see the house resume to, to a more full capacity so that we can have um, opposition days, uh, private members bills, and deal with the legislative agenda that's before us. So there's been a num you know, number of bills that have been brought forward and we haven't had a, a chance to really debate them since uh, March because everything's been focused on, on dealing with the pandemic, which is of course what the focus should be. So uh, as Alain said, we're, uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith this riding is within the territories of Nanaimo. Uh, Staminas, Snanawas, and Lyaxon, and um, it's a, a honor and privilege to serve in this riding and to represent the people in this riding. One of the areas of this riding is Gabriola Island, and um, today I have guests with me from uh, Gabriola Health and Wellness Collaborative, Steve Earle and uh, Diane Dunsmore Farley, and um, uh, Gabriola has a a different way of doing things. It's, uh, it's um, an interesting community, a very innovative community. And so I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Diane and Steve to join me with this in this uh, community conversation and talk, talk to us about uh, what they're doing with the Health and Wellness uh, Collaborative 
on Gabriel Oil Island and how this uh, organization is set up and operates. So welcome, Diane and Steve. I think you're, yeah, I'm gonna pop your cameras and mics on. Thank you, Paul. Glad to be here. I, I'm here, but my camera keeps turning me off. Uh oh, <laughs> technology. Welcome. This is this is Zoom Parliament right here. Uh, this is my virtual Parliament House of Commons, right here. Um, I uh, I call it the virtual Parliament. My family calls it the basement. <laughs> So would, would you like to start, Diane, or would you like now to start? Now that I'm here, yes. Yeah, I'm here now. I would love right. to start. Thanks very much, Paul and Milan, and hi, everybody out there. Um, yeah, my name's Diane Dunsmore Farley, um, and I've been a uh, Gabriel resident for 16 or 17 years now. Prior to that, I was a public servant in the provincial government and spent most of my career writing policy for BC communities or designing programs for BC communities. But it was really only when I moved to Gabriola that I started to see what the impacts of those design from afar policies and programs were, and particularly in small communities. So I've been active in the community since I got here 16 years ago. And more recently, I uh, st um, started my PhD and I'm going to be defending in August of this year. So my focus is on how small communities govern themselves in the face of uh, crises like the COVID pandemic or economic ruptures, et cetera. So um, this work is kind of near and dear to my heart and the work of um, the Sustainable Gabriola, which is the sort of forerunner organization of the Gabriola Health and Wellness Collaborative. Uh, those two organizations pretty much take up a large part of my life and I, uh, find it very rewarding to be working in the community uh, with colleagues like Steve. So you wanna, you wanna pick it up and introduce yourself, Steve? Sure, I can do that. Um, so I was born in BC and I, I lived elsewhere for quite a few years, but uh, came back to central Vancouver Island about 30 years ago and then moved over to Cape Riola about 11 years ago. And I just love it here. I, I wouldn't, don't wanna be anywhere else. Um, and one of the striking things that I discovered as soon as I got here is, is the significant degree to which ordinary people get engaged in doing things, important things for the community. Um, it's partly about uh, the people of Gabriel, they're, they're a little bit different, uh, the culture of the people, um, but perhaps mostly about the, the small size of the population and the very well-defined border of this community. Um, and, I, and I think that makes a real difference to how people interact with one another. Um, so I've had the privilege of being involved in some of those groups right from early on. And, and it's been extremely rewarding working with other Gabrielans, including Diane and many others on a variety of different projects. Could you tell tell me a little bit about how the um, the collaborative, the health and wellness collaborative, came together, and uh, a little bit about about the work that it does? Sure. Um, so I, I I sort of alluded to this earlier. The collaborative actually kind of emerged out of the Sustainable Gabriola. So Sustainable Gabriola is a network organization representing a whole array of, of uh, topic areas related to sustainability, but not just uh, what we think of as sustainability, you know, clean air, water, energy, et cetera. Um, also things like human health and well-being, uh, governance, uh, creativity. So while I was uh, involved in with a small group of people in getting Sustainable Gabriola going, we had a uh, suicide epidemic, if you want to call it that, on the island. We had a high number of suicides. It was very concerning. And I went back to folks at the, at the Sustainable Gabriola group and I said, would you support us taking on a, a working group on mental health? And they said yes. And some people uh, signed up to engage in doing the work. And I reached out to the community. Uh, just about everybody I talked to 
well, not just about everybody I talk to, the doctors, the ambulance people, the uh, police, the fire people, the community service agency, um, all kinds of people said, yeah, this is really important. We need to do something together about this. And so we, we implemented a, a strategy. It took us two years to develop a strategy and eventually it was uh, resourced and funded over a number of years. And once we completed that work, it became clear that that task had been done, but there was really a powerful force that existed in this collaboration of people, of people who would actually come together, put their heads together around what was needed for the collective interest of the community and put aside all those those territorial differences that we have, you know, I'm a doctor or I'm a this or I'm a that, and just roll up their sleeves and say, this is what I can bring, this is what I can bring and tackle the problem. Um, so that was how the Gabriela Health and Wellness Collaborative emerged. And there's been a, a number of other projects that I guess came out of the forerunner with Sustainable Gabriela. Um, Steve, can you tell me a little bit about GERDI and what uh, GERDI stands for? Sure, Gertie um, is the Gabriola Environmentally Responsible Trans Island Express. It's a community bus. It's kind of a unique type of bus. It's not a BC Transit bus uh, system. It's, it's, it's community operated. Uh, and, and this started about 10 years ago. Uh, we, a number of us thought it would be great if we had a bus here. We need a bus here and the regional district said no that you don't have enough population for a bus and bc transit said no there's no way you can have a bus it's just too small and 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 we didn't take no for an answer and that's kind of um the community spirit here we don't uh easily get turned down uh so we decided to do it ourselves uh, and uh we um put together some funding that we could find and we got some um gas tax funding from the federal government to buy a couple of buses and in 2016 we started operating a bus system on Gabriola with uh, complete volunteer drivers um, and uh, it, it grew and it grew uh, actually 2013 is when we started uh, in 2016 we were able to get funding from the community through property taxes that was done via the RDN. Um, and, uh, and the bus has been a wonderful uh, addition to life on Gabriola. Uh, in, initially, it was all about uh, the environment, um, getting people out of their cars. And, and a lot of people were able to stop driving, get rid of a car, um, and so on. Uh, and and so the, the goal was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions primarily. But um, over the years, we've discovered that it's actually a, a vital part of the community. There are a lot of people that don't have transportation options and, and now they have the bus um, and, and not just community members. A lot of, uh, you may be aware, a lot of uh, people come into Silver Bay by boat uh, in the summertime and they're kind of stranded out there if they need to get groceries or something from the drugstore they they're they're not able to and uh so the bus provides that option for them as well um it's it's, it's a it's a real community treasure i i believe <clears throat> so uh, right now ridership is down as it is in in bus systems everywhere uh because of covid but but we're still going and uh, one of the questions that we've had to to ask ourselves, is it is it something we should continue? Is it safe to keep operating the bus? And, and we've answered that by saying it's, it's, it's better that people are using the bus than hitchhiking or getting rides with neighbors uh, during this pandemic. So we're carrying on. Yeah, it's a um, interesting, you know, it's an interesting culture on Gabriel. Like when, you, when we were talking about this before about the structure of the organization and how you operate, um, you're not your typical organization. And um, do you want to just talk a little bit about that, Diane, about how, how it is that you, you work? You're more uh, collaborative, consensus-based? Yeah. Um, I think the, 
the, the critical piece is that there doesn't appear to be a strong need uh, in the island for, for us to do things in a formal structured way. Um, in fact, we found that we are freer by being unstructured. So both the Sustainable Gabriola and the Collaborative are networks. They're not nonprofit societies, they're not cooperatives, they're networks. And that means that the uh, ability to participate is pretty much very open. Uh, the Collaborative is a little more focused on uh, engaging people around certain areas in the um, sort of health and well being area. But Sustainable Gabriola is open. They, have, we have a monthly meeting, anybody can come. Um, and uh, that openness means that we're constantly leaving the door open for different and new ideas. And we're prepared, I think part of the, the, the value of this approach is uh, that we have to be really honest with ourselves and our community about the issues that we tackle and how we tackle them and whose voices get heard. And I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that either Sustainable Gabriola or the Collaborative has overcome the tendency that exists in most communities, which is the folks with a certain degree of power or privilege are the folks with voice. But certainly in both organizations, there are efforts made all the time to reach out, to find, to hear from other people, to hear those other voices and to ensure that we do the work that we do with their needs in mind, not just what will work for us. So I, I, think, I think that's one of the, uh, the, the fundamental things that's really important is the, and it's non-hierarchical, right? So there is no chair and there's no minutes, there's notes and there's, we rotate the chair each week. The notes are often rotated though, every once in a while some brave soul will agree to do it forever, which is so nice. Um, and, and, uh, and we don't use Robert's rules of order where we do consensus decision-making. And it's amazingly, um, once you get it, it's amazingly easy to do. And one of the things that really um, hit me was watching people come into, for instance, the collaborative and seeing their first few meetings where they were acting like you would do in a normal environment where you would represent your organization almost in a competitive way. Like this is what we do and aren't we good and look at all these things we've done. And it, it takes a few meetings before the light goes on and people go, oh, it's about collaborating. It's about what can I do that will help us achieve this common objective? And what can that group do that will help me in achieving that common objective? Once that light goes on, it's just like, it's magical. I mean, it really is. You get goosebumps watching it happen. So those, those are a couple of the things. I mean, I think um, my research said, suggests that there's a, a whole series of other things that are going on here that are fundamental to the kind of governance that we engage in on this island. But I will let, I will let that go for now, unless you want me to say more about that. Um, well, what, one of the, the amazing projects that's happened over on Gabriola is the building of the health center. And that, I think, came in at about a third of the budget that it would have normally cost based on the sweat equity that people put in on construction and all of the work that went in. I know I was on the board of Mid-Island Co-op uh, during the fundraising part of that, and uh, everybody on Gabriola was using the same number uh, to, so that all of the uh, equity from uh, their spending in the co-op would go towards the health center and that breaks the rules of the co-op but we were like ah Gabriola you know they're different over there and we'll just let that go we're not going to argue about that but um, can you tell me a little bit about that about the importance of the health center and how that came together yeah um, the health center really was a community effort and and it came together primarily because of a desperate need to be able to sustain a doctor in the community. Um, we've had a revolving door of doctors and it's completely understandable. Being a rural physician in a small community means that you don't have a life. If you don't have the support 
of a team behind you and you you know you're running basically doctors run small businesses so you imagine that one or two physicians who do people call in the middle of the night with an emergency? And so they work during the day, they work at night, they work on weekends, they don't have lives. So building the clinic was a decision made when a group of people came together and said, we're never gonna be able to have the, the number of doctors we need in this community unless we can provide them with a facility in which they can practice and they don't have to worry about some of that stuff. And there's enough of a, a, a group that they can cover off for each other. So they're not all on call, each one on call every single night. So the community came together and as you said, Paul, they raised money, but mostly they put in sweat equity. And it was, uh, you know, the, I would say 90% of the resources that went into building that, that, that clinic, which is a beautiful place, by the way, uh, were raised by the community, um, maybe 10%, no, not even 10% came from government. So, and that only came later in the day. And, it, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that I think that organizers didn't reach out to government and say, can you help us with this? It was that we weren't getting much in the way of response. And like Steve says, you know, this is the kind of place where we don't take no as the last thing, right? Like it's, okay, well, we still need this. So what do we do? So that was just a, a incredible community effort right across the entire fabric of the community, not just the organizations, but you know all the trades. I mean, people were giving their time away. Uh, and, um, and so there's a great deal of pride in the community that we have the clinic. And now we have three doctors. We still have um, what's called a panel size. In other words, the number of patients per doctor is still way too high than it should be but we are really hopeful that we'll be able to attract one or two more doctors and then we would have the right number of patients per doctor. Um, and so that's what we're aiming for right now is, is working on that because our ability to, um, to maintain those doctors is, is the ability to make sure that they are supported properly and that they aren't spending their nights and weekends going to call outs. They're only spending some of their nights and weekends going to call outs. Yeah. Did you, do you have something that you wanted to add there, Steve? Oh, you're muted. You hit the, hit the space. I'm not, there you go. here I am. Um, Diane has been more closely involved with the clinic than I have, but it's an amazing uh, venture, that clinic, and, and just the, the amount of time that was put in by community members to build it, it, it's, it, was, a, it was just extraordinary to see. But it also means that you know, the community has ownership of this facility. Everybody is proud of it, and uh, it, it's really a, a huge asset. And, and it's just an example of the kind of thing you can do in a, in a community like this where people collaborate and pull together. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a wonderful example. Um, there's a question from the chat and I think it's about just kind of clar clarification. This is from Eileen. Um, she asked, please speak to what collaboration means and how it is being created and built in the community across three sectors. And she's assuming that that means three levels of government uh, maybe not, as well as how it includes citizens. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so great question. Thanks, Silene. Um, so you know, building that means that you reach out to all parts of the community to build that collaborative model. So let me use the mental health plan. When we had that crisis in our community. Uh, I reached out to everybody I could think of, the doctors, the, um, the first responders, the um, alternative health practitioners, uh, the community organizations. And, and one of the things that happens when you do that is that they start to identify other organizations that could be uh, important to achieving the objective. So, in order to collaborate, the, one of the first things you have to do is you have to come up with a common objective that everybody who's at the table can buy into because um, you, you can't collaborate if you don't agree where you're going. And so collaboration means 
putting the interests of your particular organization or your, for instance, if you're from government, because we have all of our local government representatives participate in the Health and Wellness Collaborative, um, as well as um, a whole array of different people, including our, um, our Lands and Trails Trust, including uh, Steve representing the transportation sector in our community. So not, not everybody is involved in every project, but when you identify projects and people sign on, they are signing on to achieve something in, in common. And that's the difference between collaboration and the usual way of doing things, which is um, each, per, each organization is trying to achieve a goal, but in isolation of the other organizations in the community, it's a very powerful um, approach. I think one of the, um, one of the models that you could look at, Eileen, is something called collective impact. Uh, and that is a model of planning that basically says to people, you come to the table, we don't expect you to do what you can't do. We expect you to make contributions of what you can do. And that's particularly useful in government contexts because often they have mandates that are quite narrow and, and, and restricted. And so it focuses on what you can do. Now in the community context, uh, our mandates are not quite as restrictive and some of us don't even have mandates other than getting some stuff done for the community. So we're a little more free in that, in that respect. Yeah, that's great. I, I just could add something. Um, because Eileen asked about how the community voice and, and getting people to be part of decisions. One of the <clears throat> initiatives that's come out of Sustainable Gabriola is called Gabriola Talks. And um, it started a couple of years ago and uh, maybe not even that, uh, less than that. Um, and it's a group of us organizing sessions sort of like town hall sessions, but a little bit different uh, because we like to do things differently here um, where everybody in the community is invited to come and sit down and talk about issues that are important to them. And of course we ask our elected representatives to come and listen, um, but really it's the, it's the voice of the community members um, that that's important and, and um, it's, it's a collaborative, collaborative sort of process um, and, and decisions are, are, are reached um, by consensus within these sessions. So we've had several of these Gabriella talk sessions. Um, and the last couple of them have been about climate change and what we can do here on Gabriola to reduce our climate impacts. Uh, and uh, they've been very successful. Lots of people have come. Uh, of course, in, in any community, there are people that, that won't speak up um, and, and it's, it's hard to get them to come to these kind of things, but uh, we have a, we've had a pretty good cross-section of people coming and, and talking about issues. And, and you've had a couple of projects, um, Steve, along that line with, uh, you know, working on the climate issue. Um, can you talk a little bit about those, um, the projects, the solar solar projects and the heat pumps and? Sure, well, I, first I, I'll, I'll talk about some issues that we have um, related to transportation um, because we think it's really important to get people walking and biking rather than driving, but the road network on Gabriola isn't that great for, for walking and biking and, and we've um, been working on that. We created a group called Cycle Paths, that's cycle with a C, not a P. Um, and uh, uh, we've been advocating for improvements to infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists. Some of that work has been done. It's slow to get anything going. Um, but more is coming, and uh, so that's that's one one of those kind of initiatives. Um, uh, another of the outgrowths of sustainable Gabriola is in a, the development of several co-ops on on the island. There's always been the Mid Island Co-op, but we've recently created several new co-ops that are community co-ops. Uh, one of them is an investment co-op. And so people that have some money to invest can invest it 
here on the island for projects on the island. Um, another one is uh, a sustainable energy co-op. And, and in that group, we've been uh, working on solar, in installing solar energy. Uh, we also have a project where we turn waste vegetable oil from the community's restaurants into biodiesel and that biodiesel goes into the bus. Um, and another project of that group is the heat pump project um, where we um, purchase heat pumps and provide them to uh, residents only a little bit above cost. Um, so they're very affordable and, and uh, there are hundreds of heat pumps here on Gabriola. Uh, we probably have greater <clears throat> proportion of heat pumps per capita than anywhere else in Canada. Um, so, and, and that's, it's an energy saver. It's, it's uh, something that's going to uh, help the environment. Uh, so those are just a few of the things that we've been doing. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'd heard a lot about the solar, the solar projects over on the island. Um, Diane, there's a lot of myths about the demographics on on the um, on uh, Gabriola, and you face some of the same kind of social issues that uh, we have in in larger communities like Nanaimo. Can you talk talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think I think we do suffer, not just Gabriola, I think all of the Gulf Islands suffer from um, uh, people thinking of the Gulf Islands as these places where well-to-do people come to retire and live on their oceanfront homes. Well, there isn't enough oceanfront for all 4,033 of us Gabriolans to be there, so really only a few people have those properties. And in fact, although we, we do have a large population of people over the age of 61, half of our population is over 61, uh, but the other half is under, and that means their working age or their children. Um, we do have a much uh, lower, higher rate of low income than the BC rate, about 20, I think it's either 24 or 27% of our population lives in low income. We also have an extremely high low income uh, rate for children. So 38.4% of our children live in poverty. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. Also, we have a, a, a serious homelessness problem. Now, you don't really see it here because in Gabriola, we kind of uh, find ways to wrap ourselves around and find ways of supporting folks however we can. Uh, primarily through our social service agency, which is People for a Healthy Community. But if you look at the statistics for homelessness in BC, for every British Columbian, for every 653 British Columbians, there's one homeless person. In Nanaimo, it's about uh, one homeless person for every 250 something, I think it is. And Gabriola, it's one homeless person for every 65 Gabriolans. So we, um, we have real problems. We have what some folks would describe as big city problems, but because of the strength of our community and because also, as Steve mentioned at the front end, uh, we are a very defined community. We have water all around us. So you have to wanna to get here and it's really hard to get here. And when you get here, it's then difficult to leave. Um, so we, tend to be able to identify within our community the parts of the population that are struggling and that have needs and to look at ways of wrapping supports and services around them. Um, and, you know, and I, and I think um, the one way of looking at it would be to say, well, you've got this large population of retired people. So clearly you've got tons of volunteers and it's true. I mean, that's something that uh, we, are, we are very fortunate in many communities with larger retirement populations can draw on that. But by the same um, virtue, we are looking at uh, people who are not getting any younger. So the timeline of us being able to draw on this rich well uh, is constrained. It's not gonna be like disappear because we'll have a shadow boom following the baby boomers, which is my generation. So, you know, we hope that we can keep that culture of uh, community volunteerism and responsibility, this 
to work towards the collective interest of your community alive um, in the future as well. Mm -hmm. And and housing housing uh, renting isn't uh, exactly cheap or uh, easy to find as well, right? It's a, it's a That's right. The, the cost of buying a house is about roughly the same as Nanaimo, but the cost of renting is significantly higher. And that's because many of the properties, I think something like 74% of our of the housing on Gabriola is occupied by those, the, the usual resident, that's what the census calls it, people that are there, for the most part, they're the full-time occupiers of their homes. Um, but about 27% uh, are not the usual resident. In other words, they're used seasonally or they're used as rentals or they're used as um, sometimes Airbnb or seasonal rentals. So that means that there's a large um, proportion of our housing that's not available uh, for regular occupation. And so this has really driven up the cost of, of renting on the island. And because we have a low income population and we have mostly service sector jobs on the island, uh, and they're not always, well, they're mostly not very high paying. They're minimum wage jobs. There's often part-time, part-year, that kind of thing. Um, the ability to earn enough money to buy a home is constrained. And so rentals become very, very important. And one of the things that's just happening on the island is um, a group of people got together and created a housing society. And they are now um, before the island's trust with a proposal for rezoning for a, I think it's a 24 unit uh, uh, affordable housing project in the village core of the community. And it'll, it'll be the decision about whether the bylaw will go through will happen, I believe this fall. And then they will be applying to BC Housing uh, for some funding uh, for the housing. So really exciting uh, when we think about our homeless population that the possibility of, and not just the homeless, but people who are marginally housed, people who are low income, that, that we will be able to house them appropriately in the future. Yeah, you need to make sure that you have housing for people who are doing service jobs on the island that don't uh, pay so well and and they, they need to get by and they need to, to uh, have, have comfortable accommodation. I think yeah. that, you know, happening in, in communities, um, all over. You were saying before that, you know, it's Gabriel is designated as a rural community and you have other communities like Qualicum Beach, which is designated as a rural community, but you have completely different issues from other rural areas. And part of that's because you're an island and uh, the yeah. demographics and yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting when, when I was talking about that um, in our previous conversation, um, the rural designation that I was referring to is communities could can choose, the doctors in communities can choose to be either a member of the family physicians of BC or the rural and remote division of family practice. So Gabriola, their docs here, made the decision to join the rural and remote division. And so did the people in Qualicum. Now, Qualicum is a town. It's got way more population. It's got streets, streets, street lights and sidewalks and all that stuff and, and municipal water and sewage. I mean, it's got all these mod cons, but um, they're, they, perceived themselves quite rightly as rural in terms of their access to healthcare. So, um, so yes, so every rural community is very unique uh, and the needs that they have and the ways that the responses that they can mount to address those needs and the responses that we need to have back from our governments need to be able to discern that a cookie cutter approach is not gonna work What's going to work in Qualicum Beach is not necessarily going to work in Gabriola. Mm -hmm. so Steve, uh, back to the climate change issue and and uh, I guess well resilience in general because we're we're dealing with this COVID crisis now and it's it's um, an issue we're seeing with supply chains for PPE and I think the next supply chain we're going to have problems with is is food because we're seeing farms in Florida and California and Mexico in Ontario that are being shut down because workers are getting sick. Can you talk a little, little bit about the sort of resurgence of young farmers on the island and the, and the food movement there? I know you've got a, you have a great farmer's market on the island. 
That's right. Um, interestingly, this goes back to co-ops in a way. And one of the earliest co-ops in, in British Columbia was the agricultural co-op here on Gabriola way back in the 1930s. Um, and it's been in existence ever since then, but it had sort of uh, lapsed a little bit, if you like. And, and with this uh, push to develop other co-ops, we have reinvigorated the agricultural co-op of Gabriola. And uh, there's a lot of younger people now that are involved with that. And um, there's quite a resurgence of young people farming, um, finding ways to get land because land's expensive um, and uh, creating farms or, or, or uh, make, rehabilitating farms or taking farms over from others. And, and it's really exciting to see that. As you said, we have a, a, a great farmer's market here every Saturday, another one on Sunday at the other end of the island. Um, we, use, we had one on Wednesdays last year, but that's kind of in, in advance at the moment because of COVID. <clears throat> but there's, there is a strong push here, as there is everywhere, um, to grow more local food and provide more local food and, and encourage residents to buy more local food so that we are not dependent on food that comes up the I-5 or gets flown in from other places uh, farther away than that. Um, because um, with climate change and all sorts of things, uh, we know that we have to be more self-reliant than we've become. And of course, locally grown fresh food is, is better for us than, than a lot of the stuff that comes from the supermarket. So it, it's, it's great to see um, so much, um, so many young people that are involved in farming here now. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so how, how has the community been dealing with the COVID crisis? Um, you know, communities are responding in different ways. Um, what, what, what have you seen on Gabriola that, how, how have people been working together on this issue? Well, go ahead, Diane. Oh, it's okay, Steve, you go ahead and then I'll jump in. So one of the first things that happened was that Diane initiated a emergency response and recovery committee and it was an outgrowth of the health and wellness collaborative. Um, and, and so we assembled a group of people uh, uh, healthcare people, um, uh, all sorts of different, uh, the, the police, the fire, the ambulance. Um, I was involved because I'm involved in transportation issues and, and uh, we started a series of meetings and at the early stages we were meeting twice a week to, to figure out a Gabriola response to COVID because we didn't know what was coming. Um, for example, in the early days, we thought that if there was an outbreak on Gabriola, there was the potential that ferry workers would be affected and that, that the ferry might not be able to run as, as it does. And that, that could have a whole series of knock-on effects for us because we are dependent on that ferry. Um, so um, the, the meetings also included our, our elected officials uh, from the regional district and the Islands Trust and uh, it, and it was really valuable. I mean, I was there as a, as a transportation representative and, and for me, it was very useful to be able to ask these healthcare people what we should do, how we should keep the bus going, uh, what sort of measures do we need to put in place to, to do that safely. And uh, so I found it very useful. We, we, the, the, there aren't as many meetings now because it's, seems to be a little bit in advance, but who knows, it, it certainly could come back. It is coming back a little bit. Um, I'll let Diane talk more about it. Sure, just to add to that, um, you know, we sort of pivoted and morphed back into the Gabriola Health and Wellness Collaborative because basically the emergency uh, response and recovery group for COVID was a group of people from the collaborative plus some additional folks. So once it became clear that we had established enough uh, sufficient planning in core areas 
or worst case scenarios, then, you know, I'll ultimately we morph back into regular monthly meetings of the collaborative. But one of the things that I have forgotten to mention uh, going through this is, um, you know, in the, in the research that I've done in communities, one of the things I found is that communities are very divided between um, the economic and the social. And so when we created the collaborative, we reached out to the Chamber of Commerce and said, we need you on board. We can't, we can't talk about the health of the community if we can't talk also simultaneously about economic health. And the health of the community is crucial to our economic health. So, so that committee um, in, includes the Chamber of Commerce. And when we had the emergency response and recovery effort, the Chamber of Commerce was in there, boy, and they were working hard on behalf of the community. And, you know, and to see people working across those sectors that often do not talk to one another is, is very heartening. I mean, it gives me hope that we can get past all of these sort of divisive conversations that tend to happen around what's more important, the economy or, or health. And, you know, I think if COVID has taught us nothing else is nothing matters if we don't have good health, we won't have an economy, right? So the two things are so deeply intertwined. Uh, and that's one of the powerful things about the collaborative is that's how we work, is recognizing that all of those things are inter inter intertwined and need to be, all the strings need to be pulled simultaneously in order for us to make progress. Yeah, the business community, they are our friends, they're our neighbors, they're part of community. It's been really heartening to see the Nanaimo Chamber of Commerce uh, being really involved in the homeless situation uh, in Nanaimo and working on, on those issues. And uh, because it takes, a, it takes a, a community response to deal with these things. Um, in terms of what, what come out of the COVID uh, situation, like the, the lessons learned or the things that that um, have, have uh, maybe maybe things that you want to carry forward from the learning or from what's happened with COVID. Are there things that you can identify that uh, you would want to carry on with that you've learned from this crisis? We're in the process of of asking the community what this experience has been like for them. So we're designing a, a survey questionnaire that will go out to everybody in the community so that they can tell us how they've been affected, how they've been affected economically, socially, what it's been like to be locked up in the house almost, um, whether they've been working, uh, whether they've been able, been taking advantage of any of the, the funding provided by the government um, and so on. And, and also in, in the same questionnaire, we're asking them what they think is maybe better uh, under these conditions, what has improved, or what kind of things have changed that maybe we'd just like to hang on to. So hopefully we'll get some, some really interesting responses about that. And then again, come together as a community and talk about what it is we could keep from going through a crisis like this that will maybe be helpful for the environment or make this place more uh, socially acceptable uh, improve the lives of people in some way. Um, so it, it's going to be really interesting to hear what people say. Mm -hmm. St Steve, you're a geologist. I know you were a, a professor at VIU for a number of years, and I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about water issues on uh, on Gabriola. I know it's there's... Um... There's lots of water on Gabriola, but it's... it's uh, hard to get it to where it's needed. Um, most people that live here have a well. Um, there's no water system, as Diane pointed out earlier. There's no sewage. Um, the, the water doesn't come to your house in a pipe. So every property, almost every property has a well. Some of those wells are great and they provide good water that's nice and fresh and good to drink. Uh, but many of them are not, that they, they don't provide enough water and certain times of year they may go dry. Um, and in a lot of cases, the water from the well isn't that great to drink. Um, so 
it's a bit of a, a problem. Um, there, are, there's water. Drinking water is available at the grocery store, and people that have water that doesn't taste that good, they take advantage of that. But there are a lot of people who just don't have enough water, especially in the summer. And there are a couple of businesses, at least, that provide water. Uh, some of that water comes from Gabriola, but in fact, most of it comes from Vancouver Island. Uh, so, you know, every day on the ferry, probably there's a truck or more, several trucks coming over from Vancouver Island with water. Uh, and they'll take it to someone's house and pump it into a tank. And uh, of course, that's that's relatively expensive. It's, it's a few hundred dollars to fill up a, a big tank and uh, cons compared with places where water comes to your house in a pipe, it's, it's expensive. Um, so it, it is an issue, whether it's going to get worse with climate change or not, probably, uh, because our, our precipitation is likely to become more seasonable. We're gonna get more rain in the winter, less in the summer. And um, that means there'll be a greater chance of drying out in the summer because you can't store that much water. Um, a lot of people collect water off the roof and use that, but again, there's a storage issue. You have to, to buy tanks to store it in. Um, so yes, water is an issue. Uh, there, there have been talk in the past about creating some kind of municipal water system, but it's, it's not that straightforward and, and very expensive to do for a community like this. Yeah, very expensive. Um, so how, how are things working on the island? Like I know there's a, an influx of tourists in the summertime and uh, you know, there's artists and musicians on the island that uh, um, you know, rely on, on the tourists coming through in, in the summer season to um, you know, sell their, their art and um, the B&Bs and uh, all of those things. Are, has, has there been much tourist uh, Tra the traffic on the island since the, we've gone into phase three here? Mm -hmm. It's it's picking up. The, the ferry is pretty full these days. For, for a couple of months there, the, the long lineups that we're used to, and the ferry just didn't exist. Uh, you could just go down and get on the ferry, but that's no longer the case. Uh, there are quite a lot of people here now, but almost certainly not as many as in a, a regular summer. So anybody that's doing something that uh, relies on tourists is probably suffering economically as a result of this. It also creates a worry for people um, having people arriving on the island from elsewhere when you've, you know, mm. Vancouver mm. Island in general has done very well with yeah. COVID and uh, these smaller islands have, have been able to shut themselves off from, um, you know, the, the the wider world. I had friends who live on Gulf Islands who call uh, call Vancouver Island Canada. <laughs> you know, they're kind of like independent little little countries there with their moats. And yeah. uh, so there's a lot I, there's a lot of concern, and I've heard concern from residents about you know t tourism traffic. But it's kind of a double edged thing because some yeah. some people sure. definitely rely on it, and it's yeah. it's income. So it's a difficult time right now. I think there's a lot of there's some comments in the chat about how we could do better by in in, in the Nanaimo by learning uh, from what Gabriel has done. You've set a really good example in terms of like you know community coming together and in a way you're that's the circumstance that you're in. People on a in a small rural community that's an island. You have to rely on each other. Um, you know there's there's times when the ferry goes down or when you know winter storms or whatever where you where you rely on your neighbors you get to know your neighbors you're in a smaller community so you know other people on the island and and the way you're working together I think is uh really inspiring and so just seeing that in the chat people are inspired by uh by what you're doing well can I just throw something in here Paul yeah. um because my research was looking at small communities and how they how they stay resilient in the face of all these kind of hardships. And I started off thinking that it would only be relevant to small communities. But the lessons I learned from those small communities are that it doesn't matter if you're living in Nanaimo or Vancouver or Victoria, 
it's just a, an, an agglomeration of small communities. So, you know, if you start where you're at, if you start in your neighborhood, and if you work together, if you sh if set some common goals, work together, you're more powerful and more effective. And then you can reach out to other like communities. And that and doing the work is really, uh, it's, you know, one of the things I think is the strength of Gabriola is that people here are very grounded in place. And that's for the very practical reason of like, you're responsible for your own water for crying out loud and dealing with your sewage. But we also live in an Islands Trust community where the mandate is preserve and protect. And I think some people come here with a kind of untroubled assumption about what that means, but it truly is part of the culture here that that is meaningful and that we have a responsibility to preserve and protect. So when Steve's talking about, you know, the need for a safer way for cyclists and pedestrians to get around the island, I can assure you, unless Steve tells me I'm wrong, that we're not thinking about streetlights and sidewalks. We're thinking about semi-permeable surfaces that bicycles and wheelchairs and strollers and pedestrians can walk up and down. We're not trying to replicate a city. We're trying to live in the rural environment that we're in. And that respect for place and knowing what the importance of place is, is like a, a central to what makes small communities successful. If they fight place, they are in a constant battle of trying to overcome a very powerful force. It's called mother nature. And anybody who's had their garden get overrun on this island knows what that's like. I mean, I turned my back for, you know, 20 minutes and the forest is now encroaching again. So, you know, you have to, being grounded in place is a really important part of it, whether you're in Victoria or Nanaimo or on Gabriola, knowing your place, knowing the history of your place, knowing what came before settlers, knowing the natural history. I mean, that to me is, is really what distinguishes communities that get things done. Mm -hmm. The connection to place. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, um, when I think about the bike path you're talking about, I'm thinking about the, the path that's, you know, being connected between Tofino and Euclid, mm -hmm. where, you know, soon you'll be able to bike that whole way and not be on that highway on, on the narrow side of the road where it's, you know, I've, I've been hit by cars twice riding my bike. Both times it was the driver's fault. And uh, I'm not comfortable riding on country roads where I can't see what's coming up behind me. Uh, and people drive, drive them fast and quick sometimes, you know, to catch the ferry or to do whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I could see a real need, need for that kind of infrastructure. And are you looking at, you're looking at um, infrastructure funding for, for a project like that? We're always looking for funding for that kind of thing. And it's, it's difficult. We do have, we did get some funding um, through, oh, what is it? I forget. It's from the regional district. And, and starting this year, I hope in the fall, there will be a construction will start on a path, a roadside path through the village part of Nanaimo. And this came out of another sustainable Gabriola initiative, which the cycle paths. Um, so that that's a great start. Um, uh, but we need money for lots of other things. The Ministry of Transportation it doesn't really work well for a community like this. Um, mm -hmm. We don't, unlike a, a, a municipality, we don't have control over uh, sidewalks and those kind of things. It's all Ministry of Transportation. And um, we, we've been struggling to, to com communicate to them the kind of changes that we'd like to see to make it a more bikeable and walkable place because we think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I add to that, Paul? I, I just want to add that this is a, an excellent example of my experience in government, making policies from afar. Um, we need a, a Ministry of Highways, Rural Community Roadways policy, right? Not, uh, you live on an island and you're not a city, so therefore the road that goes around your island is a highway. That's what it's designated, it's a highway. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the policies have to be tuned to the, the environment and the culture of the place that you're serving. 
to have, consider Gabriel having a highway running around it is, well, it's a recipe for disaster. Somebody is going to get, well, we've had people harmed and hurt on the roads as it is. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it needs to be attended to. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Um, I want to really uh, thank, uh, thank you all for uh, participating. Thank you, Diane and Steve, for participating. Uh, there's been very um, inspired comments in the um, in the chat. People have been very very impressed and inspired, and, and hopefully this is going to lead to other other good things. Um, of course, you guys will keep doing the work on Gabriola, and and um, and I think you've inspired some uh, some Nanaimoites as well. Um, I'd like to remind uh, some of the viewers that. Um, uh, you can always check out uh, Paul's website at paulmanleymp.ca for future events. Uh, also, um, you'll find this uh, conversation will be posted there. So uh, if you know anybody who didn't watch this or you think might be interested in it, you can uh, send them there. Um, next week, uh, there will be Paul will be having a conversation with uh, Ladysmith Mayor Aaron Stone about uh, building back better. Uh, talking about um, Ladysmith and, and ideas for building back better as well. Um, I'd like to invite people to um, like uh, Paul's um, Facebook page, Paul Manley MP from an I'm a Ladysmith to, to stay uh, in touch and see what's happening. And you can sign up for Paul's uh, email list um, on the website as well. So and of course, uh, our, our office is open. And uh, Alan is sitting in the office now. This is my my home home space, but I'm down there as well during the days. And and if you need help with any issues related to the federal government, please do not hesitate to get in touch. We're uh, at 250-734-6400. And uh, we're on Dunsmuir just by uh, City Hall. Yeah, and you can also always send an email to paul.manley at parl.gc.ca if you need help with anything relating to the federal government. So thanks again so much, uh, Diane and Steve, and thank you, Paul, and thanks for everybody that um, watched at home and for everybody that participated in the um, comment chat. Well, thank you, Steve and Diane, and thanks for uh, holding down the, uh, the fort, Alan and Lori. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.